you very much, Paul. You. Um, so you've got 15 minutes on the MOD estate. This is going to be like speed dating with artillery. <laughs> um, so it's going to be a quick one, and I'm afraid I'm not going to be showing you pictures of Kenya, Cyprus, Gibraltar, all your nice sites, gentlemen, um, because we're going to stick into the UK. And Tim, I was very jealous to see you've got 781 scheduled monuments. We've only got 770 on the MOD estate, <laughs> but we do have decidedly more RPGs. You are yeah. quite right. <laughs> um, I thought the thing to liven you up at this point in the afternoon is a, a whole host of uh, MOD acronyms and some civil service speak. Um, that will keep you well awake. Um, in fact, we're not going to do that. This is just all the sort of things that we have to look at. I'm going to be looking particularly at the, the site for which I've got responsibility, which is the Salisbury Plain training area. The one thing I would mention is the chairman they have the TAM 100, that's Training Area Estate Management Forms, and that means that every bit of work I want to do to look after archaeology and heritage has to be agreed by a forester, a land agent, an ecologist, uh, who else, public rights away, um, and the main ones, the military, live training, dry training, and the commandant. So we get every bit of work agreed there. The crucial thing with all of this, managing these landscapes, is to talk. Um, you some may have had the misfortune to see this rogues gallery in the previous CIFA magazine. Gentlemen, wave your hands. So these are the three individuals <laughs> responsible for looking after Alex, Phil and Guy. Um, have to look after the estates right from Cape Wrath in the north down to the American bases on the east and over into the Wales. Um, it's a very big bailiwick, but somebody has to do it. I'm going to talk about Salisbury Plain though. Um, God's own Salisbury Plain and I'm working on, on the benefit of having brilliant work that's been done uh, before I was there, that's for sure. Um, Dave McComish and his colleagues at what was English Heritage put together a brilliant piece of work on the field archaeology of the training area. This is the Landsat image. You can see how relatively unspoiled it is. You've got the area, which is the training area here, unspoiled, unplowed, no road schemes, no buildings, training area. And the army, having been there since 1897, has bizarrely looked after it. So that's the training area. You've got Boscombe Down here, the other green area, unspoiled relatively. And then you've got the Novichok Testing Centre um, <laughs> down here, which is Porton Down. So um, the three military areas looked after really well. So we start off, let's go back one. That's the training area map given to all new commandants when they arrive. 38,000 hectares of archaeology on which they're able to train. 307 scheduled monuments, parts of the Stonehenge World Heritage Site at the bottom. Um, and you show them this. This is their training area. You give them the overlay of the known archaeology and they think, oh my God, we can train on a small car park outside Rolston camp. But it's all about deconfliction, finding a way that they can train. Not always easy, um, but we make it pretty clear to even the most rudimentary um, of understanding soldiers that where they can and can't dig. So this thing, the catcher in the right thing, it's one of our no digging signs, fairly obvious, um, put across the training area. In 300 years time, everyone will think there's a, a timber hinge around every monument on Salisbury Plain, but it's a pragmatic approach. Armored vehicles will see this, infantry will see this, and they'll hopefully keep away. We have had a look at looking at thermal imagery and image intensification signage, which works if they're inside the tanks at night with a bit of moonlight, but they cost too much money and the damage is actually surprisingly minimal with tracked vehicles. So we tend not to do that. This is across the state. We have different things. This one we saw last week, Phil. Um, so this is over on the Otterburn training area. Again, it's a different sign, but again, pretty obvious. Don't dig, drive a car. You can go on foot if you're reading your maps and things like that. So across the estate. Um, we've heard how linear monuments are a challenge. That's certainly true on the military training areas. You put a big area out of bounds, and our job is to facilitate military training, it's to find a way that the military can use these landscapes even when there's a huge amount of heritage. This is one of my GIS um, pages. This is a place called Chapterton Down. It's a Roman village, this area here. So the red is scheduling. All the areas around it are coloured from my areas of sensitivity. So if the military say, can we go and dig in here? We'll say no. They'll come digging requests every day for infantry putting exercises together. We say no there because that's scheduled, um, possibly here if we can cite them on the ground, and the white areas are more or less okay. Now the way that they can put those areas out of bounds and make it realistic within an exercise, certainly for the Roman linear village here, is to make that in their exercises as a minefield. So they have a thing, if you've done laser quests, anyone done laser quests, you know you fire lasers, it bleeps and all that sort of stuff. The military have that kit as well. Um, it's called something slightly fancier, and you have an envelope that say, oh, your leg's blown off or you're dead or whatever, you're out of exercise. You incorporate the Roman village as a minefield, they'll keep out. So that's a really good way of doing it. We've got cards as well. We mentioned putting cards on the table. We actually do have playing cards. Anyone who knows Mr. Dave Murdy, I'm sure some of you do. Um, there he is. Very old photograph. 
Um, but these are given to the troops. There's a set for ecology as well. And these are giving messages if they're sitting on one of the, um, the portaloos, maybe playing, you know, looking at the cards, just to give an extra thing. There's one for Cape Wrath as well, uh, one for Canada, um, and maybe on some of the other training areas as well. And some of you are familiar, we've also adopted the Hague Convention and its two protocols, protecting cultural property overseas. Think of Iraq, Afghanistan, all the heritage they've got there, Syria, of course. Um, our team tried to incorporate some of this within a training scenario. So when you've got an Afghan village put onto the training area, we've put some graves out. One way to get more people joining an insurgency is to not respect their culture. If you're driving a warrior armored vehicle over their graves, it's a bad result usually for the soldiers. So we went out, put these grave sites out, and it was approved by the military, so they put it out in quite a few of the other areas. Maybe in the future that Roman site put out of bounds as a minefield can be put out of bounds as a Roman site. That's one of my aspirations. Believe it or not, we've also got museums. Um, we've got one in uh, this place, Stanta in Norfolk. If you go online, Google Stanta. There's an Afghan village, real Afghans living there. They train through it. But there is a museum next to the mosque where we put artifacts in. So if um, uh, Tommy Atkins pushes the door in and finds the museum, um, he doesn't decide to loot it and things like that. So a little bit of training that we can get, get together. And we've heard all about heritage at risk. One of the key drivers for my team is to, um, to minimize our holdings of heritage at risk across the estates. Um, so this image on the left is Wessex archaeology looking mournfully at one of our barrows that was deemed at risk. And you can see Benjamin, Bunny and the crew um, working hard on the one on Silk Hill on the right. Um, I've got to apologise for this slide. Any archaeologist with a nervous disposition, some of the threats are quite fearsome. <laughs> <laughs> it's not military damage that is the big thing. Burrowing animals is my big threat. Um, badges in particular, because although they're great at digging, they're rubbish at recording, and they've obviously watched grand designs because they want these big residences all the time and they keep on digging. So we have to exclude them with Natural England, with our ecologists, with conservation volunteers looking at it, get them moving elsewhere. Then we can put the cat flaps on and then mesh over the monuments at, at the end um, where possible. But it's not always possible because people love badges. They do love badges. You'd be surprised the amount of trespassing we get on our estate. They'll come in, they'll um, take the wire off, let the badges back in, uh, and then we'll have to start again between July and December, and it won't do the badges any good. It's a real challenge that we have. We do have a certain amount of money that is enabling us to do good works, and uh, I feel sorry for my historic buildings colleagues because to get a building off the at risk register can cost many, many millions on our estate. For a barrow, you can sometimes be um, a little bit more pragmatic and take it off for a few thousand pounds. Sometimes, in historic England agreed in this case, you can excavate. Um, this is an Anglo Saxon cemetery which we were losing. Um, data on very, very quickly at Barrow Clump to badger damage, the badgers are being let back in. They agreed that we were able to excavate this with some of our, our wounded soldiers on the Nightingale program. Wonderful results in this 6th century um, cemetery, about 80 burials, and you see the chap here with a spear and a pot, very gender specific, our Saxons. Um, but it was good that we got redressed to a certain pot of money to look after sites. Now we do try and prevent damage, doesn't always work. Um, some of the more observant amongst you can see there's a slight bit of damage on this one. Um, one of the old range targets in the artillery impact area, they used to train this at the Battlesbury Bowl on the plane. Um, the range target was supposed to be moved off these lynchets here, um, probably done on a Friday afternoon if I'm honest. Instead of moving it lengthways across, they did it like Alton Towers. Um, and you can sort of see the scum has gone down here. So not a great bit of, uh, a bit of um, thinking really, but the main thing is to own up. Get the Historic England um, Heritage Risk Project officers, they are now out, have a look at it, work a mitigation strategy together, um, regrade the monument, mesh it to make sure it doesn't degrade, make sure Natural England's happy, make sure the military's happy, um, and make sure it doesn't happen again, put those programs together. Bizarrely, military damage can become heritage in its own right. When I joined the MOD, these sparrows, um, you may see a little bit of disturbance, I was told the, the Americans did that, the Second World War, the Americans did that. Um, and I looked at the air photographs in Swindon and found it was done in about 1938. So, unless it's very early damage by uh, very early Americans, it's Brits. But that's in the scheduling documentation. That's down as um, obvious historic tank damage. And the tanks themselves become heritage assets. A lot of times I get asked about the Sherman tanks on the impact area. Can we have them um, for museums? Um, heritage takes many, many guises. The Kiwi being a case in point, um, our most recent designation on the plane, made in 1919, designated as centenary approach to the Battle of Messines in 1917, built by the Canadians in 1919, 
Um, and now our job to keep it off the at-risk register by re-chalking it. Luckily, we have access to certain bits of kit that makes it a little bit easier. Hopefully it doesn't go like that, um, but nonetheless, we're looking at doing that in the future. So we as a team are looking at innovative ways of making sure our monuments are useful, provide a heritage narrative to the main um, customer, or they don't really want the customers armed, in the military, um, to make sure that they are cognizant of what an important area it is, not just for training, but for heritage. We are custodians of such an important estate. We don't have any exemptions. It's a surprise to some people. We don't have planning exemptions. We don't have exemptions from scheduling. Um, technically we do, but we follow a parallel process. So if we want, in this case, to put a new range in place, or um, it's, it's a new targeting range, you've got the firing range here, perhaps a less, well, that's not a drunken version of that. That's um, a Bronze Age linear ditch over the firing range. We still have to apply a schedule monument clearance to get the permissions in place, get a contractor, in this case, Wessex Archaeology, in to assess the, the site before we do any field work. Oh. Bits of World Heritage as well. I mentioned we've got um, the Stonehenge World Heritage site on, um, on Salisbury Plain, or a little bit of it, maybe more in the future. Um, we imaginatively put a sewage works across the Cursus. Um, that was in the 1930s. And we're trying to remove it as part of the aspirations within the management plan that we worked at the moment. Um, we also get the odd opportunities to get people having the team photo there. That's why I learned that the American camouflage works brilliantly with sarsen. So if the Druids ever go to war with America, they've had it. Um, we've also got, we've got parts of 10 World Heritage sites. The one below it is one that uh, Alex has been to recently St. Kilda. We only let him there because it gave us the opportunity to dunk him in a helicopter testing tank. Um, so really, really important. Um, we're trying to help, help out with the Neolithic food thing that's going on with English Heritage at the moment. Ready, steady, cook Neolithic with soldiers. What could possibly go wrong? Watch this space. And off the estate, we also have management requirements. Guy looks after the, um, the air crash side of things with the Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre, the JCCC. We need a licence to dig out any of these things. Um, this is one in Wales, the P38 in Harlech. Um, quite a core celeb, but now designated, I believe, um, having been assessed with geophysics. So, so it's a, an important thing that Guy has to look at and make sure that heritage concerns are managed. And again, it's checking with HERs and speaking with people. Partnerships crucial, I'm not going to go through them all, but we work with universities, military units, professional units and charities, things like the John Egging Trust um, for underprivileged kids who do archaeology as part of their um, improvement. And I'll close with a picture of Seafood Sassoon, because you may wonder why I call it Flint and Spear, it's a bit weird. Sassoon lived on Salisbury Plain, he wrote a wonderful poem about Scratchbury Camp, one of our causeway enclosures and um, uh, Iron Age camps. And he was moved by this landscape from a military perspective, and you look out of it, it is an unspot thing. And that's only because people talked. Thank you very much. <laughs>